we're looking for guidance that's not just coming out of a curriculum book. We're looking for guidance that's actually coming from like a spiritual source and in that sense. And so I think that that's the ideal and that's, you know, the way I mentor, that's the way I work with faculties that I, and it's not an abstraction, it's a reality. Mm -hmm. So there's there. So each of us, we all have a soul. We all have a spirit. Um, you know, as well as a personality and a physical body and an energy body. So when you're encountering somebody, adult or a child, those are those are all present. But then, how much do we actually interact with those different parts of ourselves, mm. like and, and with another person? What is stillness? The world is layered with ideas, memes, archetypes, and ideologies. I'd like to just quickly point out the two that I enjoy reflecting on and observe within myself and others. There's people you'd describe as sprite, energetic, jumpy, those that carry themselves with a bottomless tank of restless energy. The people constantly moving like they just had their first cup of coffee, no matter what hour of the day it is. I think Rob Lowe's character in Parks and Rec, Saul Goodman, or Morty from the Rick and Morty cartoons. The people that fidget when they sit, you know, one leg pulsing up and down and up and down and on and on. In the animal kingdom, they'd be squirrels or a chicken. On the other hand, you have people with an unflinching quality about them, comfortable with making non-aggressive eye contact, taking conversations to silence, and a confidence that doesn't come off as cocky, arrogant, or contrived. I think of people like Joe Montana, Rose Namajunas, Clay Thompson, or ascetics and monks. They remind me of sloths, sea turtles, tigers, or large ocean mammals. I've always observed the differences between the two types of energies, nervous and still, and if there were any parallels between the lives of those that embodied those energies, you see it in sports all the time. Some excel under pressure and discomfort. Some are diminished by it. And if so, what type of training or upbringing nurtures a mindset that is consistent with that cool behavior? Because in those environments, whether in sports, careers, or everyday life, those that keep calm under pressure are the ones that see consistent success. Like in the animal world, those that can keep the calm survive. So if there is a question that can guide us through this conversation, and one I strive to always practice within myself, it's how do we find stillness? The way that anthroposophy grounds people who, who want to take it up as a study or to help themselves is that it's, it's a world view it's huge. It's like Steiner has given like probably the biggest worldview of you know any <laughs> philosopher, and and it's 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 pretty la large. It's pretty all encompassing. It's not perfect. I mean, it's not perfect. Steiner was a human being. There were lots of their contradictions. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not. Um, you know, he, he's not perfect. He wasn't a perfect human being. Mm -hmm. He said some things earlier on, he retracted them later, you know, so there's a lot of contradictions in anthroposophy. But I would say that the, he was so far ahead of himself in the future. You know, he was also the founder of biodynamic gardening, besides mm -hmm. Waldorf education. He was talking about the internet, like, you know, 100 years ago, mm -hmm. but calling it like he said, there will be a web that will surround the earth at a certain point that will make it more difficult for people to be able to have spiritual connection. And I think, well, here we are, we're here. We've, mm -hmm. You know, you, we were out camping in the desert in the spring and we looked up and we were looking for shooting stars and all of a sudden we saw this like, like these satellites and it was like, there were like 50 or 100 of them and it was like the Starlink. I, oh, right. We were like, yeah. what is this? And we had never seen that. And there it is, just, you know, like 100 satellites just like in a chain mm. and, you know, and that's how everybody's like hooked up. Yeah. So there's, there's the web right there. 
Dr. Karen Apana is one of the founding members of the San Francisco Waldorf School, first founded in 1978. She has been a lifetime teacher, mentor, and student of anthroposophy for over 40 years. For over 25 years, she's been teaching biography work and has a private practice for biography counseling in San Francisco. She also holds frequent biography workshops all over the Bay Area. And although she is now retired as a Waldorf teacher, she still mentors and advises teachers in the Bay Area and all over the globe. For those wondering what biography work is, it's a methodology for developing knowledge of self. A methodology founded on the teachings of Rudolf Steiner, who believed that Quote, the path of the spiritual human being to the spiritual in the world or cosmos, unquote. And that's from re- Wikipedia as I'm no expert and that is a vast oversimplification. But for those interested, please check the show notes as always. And there's links to what Waldorf education is, anthroposophy, and many others. Um, if we don't touch upon it um, to your liking in this conversation. Before meeting with Karen, I had questions like, what kind of upbringing would nurture someone to pursue this kind of work? What is biography work? How does she define Waldorf education? Do we all have a question that we live with that guides the choices that we make? And how do we answer that? Just to provide additional context, I used to work for a Waldorf school as the school chef And I can say firsthand that there is something different about students educated in Waldorf schools. One of the first things I notice is that the teachers and the students see you, not see you in the sense of the clothes or the shoes you're wearing or the features of your face and body, but there's a sense that they actually see you, your soul, your inner self, and all the fluff that latches onto us throughout our lives. And in the years that I spent in and around the community of the school, the parents, the students, the faculty, I started to slowly see why these kids own a stillness about them. And a stillness that I rarely saw in myself, especially, and in others growing up. So having a conversation with Karen and people like her are the reason why I started this podcast She was born and raised right here in San Francisco, and as you'll find out in this conversation, she is a local cosmic gem. In this conversation, you'll learn about anthroposophy and some of the philosophies behind Rudolf Steiner. It also offers a firsthand account of someone born into a generation of San Francisco coming into social consciousness during the 1960s, which eventually set the stage for many spiritual seekers, creators, activists, artists, and life enthusiasts to this day. There is much to unpack from this conversation, and for sure, this is one I will revisit personally in the years to come. Part one, who is Karen Apana and what is anthroposophy? Part two, what is Waldorf education and biography work? And part three, what question are you living with? It was an honor and delight to speak with her and learn about her life and her perspective in growing up in San Francisco during the 1960s and 70s. I am very excited to share this conversation with you as I am sure you'll enjoy it as I did. The wonderful soul, a spark of joy, a lifetime artist, another reminder that there is good in the world, a teacher and mentor to so many, Dr. Karen Apana. that what brought you to anthroposophy was uh, the the death of your father and it came at a very early age for you Mm -hmm. at 16 years old and um if from what i read anthroposophy is i think this is in your words when the spiritual in the human being meets the spiritual in the universe um So anthroposophy, and I've been around for, I've been alive for about 41 years, and Mm. I don't think it's as easy to find as thought systems like Buddhism and Hinduism or any religion for that matter. And um, I'm just curious how it came into your life 
uh, who, who, who or what led you to the teachings? Okay. That's a great question to start with. Uh, it, it really did start with my experience of my father's death. At the age of uh, 16, I was 16, my father was 42, so just a year older than you, and his death was very unexpected. He had died of a heart attack. Well, there were several things about his death which were unusual, which is that he did die in the house. There were three children, three of us, I was the oldest, and none of us woke up um, when all the emergency people came and were dealing with my father's death. We all stayed asleep, which I think was a very unusual experience. Later, when I thought about it, I thought it was almost like we were protected from that direct experience. Although some part of me was also upset that I wasn't a participant of that experience. So I kind of oscillated back and forth. Then when I went to see my father in in the funeral home and I saw this body um, I realized instantly that was not my father because the essence and the spirit of my father was no longer there and so at a really young age I started on this path of like well what is death you know where did my father go but I didn't have any answers of course but I did after my father died I did have what I would now identify as like spiritual experiences of my father, but I didn't know what they were. Mm -hmm. Like his presence was there very much um, after his death. So I was having these experiences without knowing really what it was. But I began this search of like, well, what is death? And I started reading everything I could, all kinds of books, all kinds of, from all kinds of lineages. And, and, and it wasn't until I read Rudolf Steiner when I was around, I think, 24, 25 years old, where in Steiner, he actually described very accurately um, the experiences that I had when I was 16. And so I came to Steiner out of my own experience saying, oh, this person actually knows what he's talking about because I've, he's, he's identifying and describing to me the experiences that I had. So that was how I connected to Anthroposophy was really through this affirmation of someone saying, oh no, this is what was happening for you. Mm -hmm. So that, that began my you know, starting to read Steiner, of which there is a lot to read, and it's difficult. It's not easy to read, right. <laughs> and um, but I, it was just such a. There was no doubt. I had no doubt when I read it because I. It was a confirmation. Yeah, has there had there been anything prior to that? Because what little I've read about Waldorf and Steiner and Anthroposophy. It's very esoteric and yes, rooted also in science as far as uh, biodynamic farming goes, but had there been anything leading up to this point to before you found anthroposophy to where you, you know, basically what was your practice prior to, yeah. Great question. Yeah. You're going to get even stranger now. <laughs> okay. Yes. That's what I like. That's okay. what this is all about. <laughs> okay. So... Um, yes, <laughs> I would say I was an unusual child, <laughs> and um, at the age of seven, I told my my mother, or you know, my parents, my mother, primarily, she was the one that was around more, um, that I wanted to be baptized. A Catholic. Okay. And my family was not Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, okay, okay. child, uh -huh. go figure that out yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and so I had to walk around the neighborhood to get some godparents. <laughs> and like, who's Catholic? And because you had to have Catholic godparents. And so the Italian neighbors across the street, oh, they, wow. they fit the bill. So they, and they were thrilled, you know, the, the, the uh, Nana, she was so thrilled that I wanted her to be my godmother. <laughs> so that was God. Okay, I got my godmother, yeah. and then and then it turned out 
one of my mother's cousins was a Catholic. He was a, a policeman down in South San Francisco, Joe. And so she asked Joe, would he be my godfather? And he was sort of like, okay, you know. Sort of. Wow. And so, so then I, at the age of seven, which is a little old to be getting baptized in the Catholic Church, usually you're supposed to be getting baptized as an infant, but... You know, that was, they let me do it. And so that happened at Mm. age seven. And that had nothing to do with my parents. My parents were totally the one, I was sort of raised in an interesting way. I would call it like, not as a criticism, but as a positive kind of benign neglect. Okay. (laughs) And and that, and that just meant that there wasn't a lot of control (laughs) around how I was raised. And actually there's a benefit to that. And it's not like I was a neglected child. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying there wasn't a lot of, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that. I was like kind of a free agent. And in the (laughs) days that I was growing up, that was a real that was a real asset, a real yeah. benefit. Yeah. You know, I got to have a lot of my own experiences out of my own like self will, you know, as a kind of the kind of child I was. So you you mentioned South San Francisco. That's where you grew up? In- no, no, I grew up in San Francisco, but oh. my no, my godfather was in South San Francisco. Wow. Yeah, I know I grew up in I'm a native San Franciscan. Um, I'm living within five blocks of where I was born. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I probably a rare, that's probably a rare uh, experience. Interesting. I grew up on, uh, I think my first house was on Albion Street between 16th and 17th. Mm-hmm. And then we moved to Prosper Street between 16th and 17th. And then now, and then I lived up on, um, uh, off of Divisadero, and now I'm here. And so that's basically, that's been my location. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, So, And that has definitely, I would say, colored (laughs) my life experiences. Yeah. And um, I was hanging out with some of my artist friends today, and we were sketching together, and some of them are like East Coast New Yorkers, you know, and I said... (laughs) That I when I the first time I went to New York I was I was an adult, and I was like shocked because I thought I actually live in a small town and I never realized that San Francisco was a small town yeah. until I went to New York. Yeah. So I kind of feel like my upbringing here is like a small town girl, but in a cosmopolitan environment because the world came to me. Wow. I didn't have to really go out to the world. I mean, every guru, every teacher, every major philosophy, <laughs> spiritual development, rock and roll group, you know, like was my upbringing. Mm-hmm. And just without having to like do much except show up. Wow. So... That, that's something that you and I share very much in common with, uh-huh. only that I didn't seek out Catholicism at a very young age. It was something that was just, I just grew up in it. Okay, yeah. And um, your, your, fam- your family was My family, family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, because I was, I felt at a certain point in my life, there was a time where I didn't have the answer, but sec- I'm sorry, Catholicism didn't mm, have right. the answers for me that yeah. I was searching for at a very early age. I think I was, I must've been 16 too. Yeah. Where when, when I picked up a book and I found, it was actually about Bruce Lee mm. and then he wrote about Buddhism and Taoism. And I mm. said, Whoa, these are, this mm. is different from, I mean, did you have the same experience with Catholicism at that time? Yes, I did at a certain. So I, I should add one thing that I think is important for the conversation is that I, I'm an interracial person, which, so my father was Hawaiian and Chinese and Mm -hmm. my mother was Caucasian. Mm -hmm. And this is probably something that a lot of people don't know, that when my parents went to get married at San Francisco City Hall, Mm -hmm. they were not allowed to get married because uh, the miscegenation laws were still on the books. And that was like 1943. Wow. So that's like not that long ago. And so my liberal San Francisco, my parents actually had to go to the state of Washington to get married. Wow. And so that was, you know, something that we were always aware of. Um, and that makes me wonder, too, your last name, Apana. That's 
Yeah. Is the Hawaiian. It's the Hawaiian lineage. Chinese name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. So, yeah. So that's my father's a native Hawaiian and Chinese. Whoa. Yeah. I'm yeah. going gonna to branch off because yeah. I have to. I've never met a San Franciscan, you know, that's been around. Um, you said your parents were trying to get married during World War II. 1943. Yeah. Wow. Right? Yeah. Okay. So the changes you must have seen. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Very. In, specifically in this neighborhood where yeah. in the Castro. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when the first gay person moved in on our street. We were very excited. I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I became friends with them right away. You know, I mean, I have to think about that now in terms of like that, you know, how the neighborhood has kind of really turned. It was a very um, Irish Catholic neighborhood when we right. first were living on in Prosper Street. Wow. So, yeah. So it's, and the, I think the other thing when I was growing up was that the neighborhoods were more, defined by um, groups of cultural groups of people like North Beach was really a lot of Italians. Yes. You know, the mission was really, you know, a lot of La Latinos, Latinos and, yeah. and, and th this area was actually more Irish Catholic, this, the sort of the yes. Castro area. And then um, let's see what other, yeah. I mean, so that was, but then as, time went on that those neighborhoods started like you know people started mixing more and then of course with the influx mm -hmm. of so many people from outside of san francisco now that's completely you know it's kind of mm -hmm. really mixed so. uh and you mentioned too that your parents just they literally just let you play yeah we were just free uh, street kids just yeah. played out in the street like i could walk from my house on prosper street up to the top of uh you know rocky mountain which call we call it rocky mountain but corona heights mm -hmm. that was just like you know i just packed my lunch and just like go up there for the day and then come back you know yeah. there was nothing didn't have to worry <laughs> i mean couldn't have to worry about anything so were they involved with the the whole psychedelic hippie scene during that time is that what my my parents? Yes. No. Oh, oh no, okay. no, 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 not, not at that all. Was, that, that was the generation, that was my generation, generation that, prior. That, yeah. was, that, that was my generation. Okay, okay, yeah. I'm just no, trying no. to. Yeah, no, no, they were, no, my father was a merchant marine. He, um, he came from a very poor Hawaiian family. He was like the oldest of 11 children. And he um, actually had to lie to get on the boat to work. Hmm. And then he kind of worked his way up. You know, but it went around the world. I mean, he he loved he loved being at sea, and um, and I think actually when I think about it, I think the fact that he you know he died at such a young age, I think that he was he he never really could adjust to being on land. That he you know his life on the sea was brought him a kind of peace that he couldn't ex that it was very stressful for him to be on mm, land, and wow. so I think that was. That's just, I, I mean, and I don't know it that, make, but it, that's just like a thought that I had. It what, makes like, sense. Yeah. I, I have a grandfather who was a merchant marine, and uh, most of the time he spent uh, just in in his room um, <laughs> watching television uh, and uh. mingling with his grandchildren. But outside of that, mm. um, yeah, very calm. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I, now that you say that, it just kind of yeah, just yeah, rings a rings yeah. a bell, and I'm, I guess that might hold true now that I think about it. But I don't know, yeah, speculation, but, right? Well, because I think you know, life at sea is very isolated. I mean, you're you're sort of there's something about being surrounded by the sea, and of course, the Hawaiian Islands are also surrounded by the sea. You know, mm -hmm. water. I think there's something about the water that he couldn't experience when he was here. Wow. So mm -hmm. anyway, so that was, um, so when you're going back to my, you know, my child, so part of that, I used to like to go to church, but mostly when there was nobody there. So nice. that was, that was my church experience was very much um, me just being in church with, what I could consider like the energy of the spirits or the beings that are in the church. Mm -hmm. And so that was a place where I felt very protected. I felt um, I was a child that had capacities 
that we're not just in this world. And so I think that intuitively, I just felt that that was a place where I could mm. be protected with mm-hmm. those capacities. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I wasn't a church going child in the sense of like, you know, I related to the nuns and the priests, but that was not my primary reason to go to church. Mm-hmm. It was my own spiritual development. Wow. wow. So I think that was, so that, so I would say I was always, that was always there. And something else that should probably be added that'll, you know, kind of add to the yeah, interest please. of the conversation is that on my mom's side, um, they were Oregon pioneers, her original family. And, um, but they were, um, the, let's see, her father's mother was a, um, a clairvoyant Mm. and, um, and we have these stories about, you know, she would, um, I guess my grandfather was working in a logging camp and, uh, she wrote to him and she said, you need to move uh, because something is, you know, something bad is going to happen there and it's not safe for you to stay. And of course, he just didn't believe her. And then, so then she wrote him a second letter and she drew exactly where he was living. She'd never been there. She said, This is where you're living now. I see this. You need to get out of there. And when he got this letter with this drawing and he knew she'd never been there, he goes, Okay, <laughs> she knows. And so then they moved. I mean, he moved. Uh-huh. So she had, she had this capacity. Um, however, I think this is something that's true and it will, you know, we can fill it in with the rest of the conversation. Yeah. She also had this mixed feeling about this capacity that it was. Um, she wasn't sure where it really came from. Mm. So there was this question about this uh, psychic ability, the psychic capacities, like where, what was their source? What was their root? Mm-hmm. So that was on one side of the family, which is very strong, and it's a lineage. My uncle, my mother's brother, had it also very strong. He, he, was a, he kind of was a healer and was dealing with a lot of things uh, in his older age. And then on the Hawaiian side, of course, the Hawaiians are just naturally <laughs> yeah, like in tune mm-hmm. with the cosmos, uh, just by the root of their, you know, who they are as people on right. the planet. How they even got to yeah. Hawaii. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> stars, so, right. so yeah, exactly. Yeah, guiding. So I think between those two forces that we kind of our family lineage was pretty strong mm-hmm. with uh, that world, what I call the world of the invisible. But it causes people a lot of conflict because they don't really know how to manage it or handle it or deal with it. Right. And so that was that's been part of my path. It's like, how do I? How have I had to work with it and learn how to manage it and deal with it? Mm-hmm. So that's. And then. You know, you know, from from when you first found Anthroposophy and you read all the books, would you say that whatever was going on internally um, started your basically your mind started your perception started opening up a little bit more and more, or was it just I, always kind of? No, I think I think what Anthroposophy did for me, and I think what it can do for people, is that it actually helped to ground my. Um, my experiences, my psychic experiences, my spiritual experiences. Right. And so for me, people think that's a kind of a crazy statement when they read anthroposophy. Anthroposophy grounded you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's your ground. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it, it was definitely, it is my ground. It is because it organized, it helped me to organize my experiences to understand them and to really um, come to to be able to like manage them really i it's like and rather than just having these chaotic experiences and wondering what happened or not thinking that anything happened or like most people have experiences and they mm-hmm. dismiss them rather than saying oh what was that experience they don't they don't really take time to interpret it whereas i think with anthroposophy you know, and it has to do with like, there are these different bodies, you have the physical body, the energy body, the astral body, the higher self, you learn what, where is the experience coming from? Mm. And so, um, so I think that's how it worked for me. I think for some people, it's difficult to read anthroposophy, because it's, first of all, 
it's a translated language. It's written in tra- through translation, yes. which I think has caused a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the translations are not good. They're just not clear. They don't make sense. Um, it's, you know, and Steiner even says, and, in, in, you know, early on he said, actually, to read, if you read anthroposophy, it's actually a spiritual activity. So when you take mm-hmm. it up, it's not just, you're just not like reading literature. Mm-hmm. You're actually entering into a spiritual experience. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's disorienting for people. Right. You know, a lot of times people just fall asleep, which is a sign of a, you know, <laughs> like that they're going into the spiritual yes. world. So, um, yeah. So, and, and I would say this. There are things about anthroposophy that you can read that I, you know, if I read them 10 years ago and I would say, I just know, there's no way. I'm mm. never going there. I'm mm-hmm. not ever going to believe that idea. <laughs> and right. then 10 years later, I'm like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's kind of like it, it, wherever you are, it sort of takes you, it will change you. I mean, you will change. And if you don't want to change, then usually you don't. You right. just sort of drop it. Yes. But if you want to keep changing, you'll always find some aspect of it that takes you yeah. to, to a form of like, it's about transformation. It's about personal transformation. Right. I was always kind of resistant to the teachings of Catholicism and what the church can do. And I was very much like you too. I found more meaning Mm. out of being there when nobody else was there. Mm -hmm. You show up to church and then, you know, I've been a Catholic my whole life. People just really just want to see what you're wearing or what kind of car you're driving. And I'm like, what is this? This is not right. right. And you know, everybody's there for a good reason. But I also appreciate that when you found anthroposophy, you said that it helped make sense out of everything. And I'm the same way, too. I'm like, who am I to say that somebody who is a practicing Catholic is not experiencing yeah. Yeah. something? So I, I respect that in a way. But, you know, uh, uh, going back to, to your practice, uh, it called to you so much that you started uh, a school. Well, so, so this right. is interesting. Okay. So I... My first encounter with anthroposophy was really through the esoteric stream, Mm -hmm. through Knowledge of the Higher Worlds. That was the first book I read by Steiner. I didn't even know there was an educational system Mm, (laughs) at all. I was like, didn't know about that. And so then as I, you know, kind of started reading more, then I kind of fell into that there was this educational system. And, and I, at that point, didn't have a child. And, and I, but I thought to myself, well, if I ever do, I would want my child to be in this system. Totally. You know, I had sort yeah. of had that idea in my mind. Um, and then I had a child. With, and um, there was no Waldorf school. And I remember talking to an older anthroposophist, and I said something like, well, I have a child now, so I have to start a Waldorf school. And he goes, oh, you think just because you have a child, you can start a Waldorf yeah. school? Yeah. I mean, he actually said that to me. I said, well, yeah, I do. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And that's, and that's what happened. So, I mean, along with a group of other people. Yes, you know? so, yes. Yeah. Um, so my son was in the first uh, kindergarten of the first Waldorf school in San Francisco. Whoa. Yeah. Is it the same one that's uh, the one on Portola? Wa- the one on Washington, Washington Street. Street. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Washington Street. Okay. Washington Street off of wow. Divisadero. So originally the first kindergarten was over on Arguello Street. It was Ooh. just one little kindergarten room in uh, a Julia wow. Morgan building. It was really beautiful. And how long ago? Oh, I think I've been there to, yeah. Okay. So I know what you're talking it's about. So it's now... Well, my son is 47, so, Whoa. so yeah, and he was four, so. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, so he was in the first kindergarten. Wow, and what does he do now? <laughs> he was doing uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work, okay. uh, you know, as a, you know, uh, uh, individual, but, but now he's just um, 
has a job at Lick Wilmerdine High School, mm, mm-hmm. and he's going to be a teacher and has some kind of administrative job there okay. that he just started two okay, days ago. <laughs> got it. Yeah, I'm just so curious because, you know, the I've only yeah. seen the beginning stages. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm fascinated because I know oh. some teachers are, they've been Waldorf educators or in the yeah. Waldorf right. school system their whole, their entire lives. And I'm just curious as to what, where, where they're, yeah, 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 I'm fascinated, but, oh yeah, back to your, so you went through the teacher training and. So I um, was, I was, um, I, I didn't go through the official teacher training in the way that it was more like training on the job. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that I went through that, the mm-hmm. experiential, I'm more of an experiential learner. <laughs> so I love that. that that's yeah. the, like, um, I was in the, I, so back to like education, I think this is important too, that <clears throat> I was um, given a scholarship. I went, to, I went to a Catholic, I went to Catholic school. I went to down on, um, used to be Notre Dame. It's not there anymore on Dolores Street, oh, wow. <clears throat> 16. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I was in high school and I remember the nuns saying, well, you need to go to college. And I was like, college? No, no, my, nobody, my mother wasn't saying you need to go to college. That wasn't even on the yes. table as a conversation. And, but they said, you need to go to college. Okay. And so I was like, okay. <laughs> and so then they said, we're going to give you a scholarship to our four-year college down in Belmont. <gasps> and so, Whoa. so that's like, okay. So I, told my mom I'm you know gotta go to Belmont now (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's like go to the suburbs and I and it was an all-women's college at the Mm -hmm. time and I um it was okay but I it wasn't really what I wanted to do at the time I sort of had been in an all-girls school all that time and I thought no it's time to like you know be mixing more so I I went in and I turned the scholarship in I said that I was, you should give it to somebody else. They were like, totally, they just looked at me like I was insane and crazy. <laughs> like, like she's, and I just said, no, really, you should give it to somebody else. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. And I left, but I didn't tell my mother. I didn't tell anybody. I Whoa. just did that on my own. Whoa. And, uh, and then I came on, oh, now what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, and I was babysitting uh, for this couple. It was an interracial couple. And they were working uh, with, for Martin Luther King at the mm, time, mm-hmm. and they were very, very radical and very involved, and you know, going back and forth, you know, to the Selma, and, um, and they said, "Oh, you need to go to San Francisco State. That's where it's happening, Karen." Right. You know, and so they they got me an application. I filled it out. I didn't know anything, and then. I got a letter in the mail that said I'd been accepted. Wow. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to San Francisco State. Yeah. And so that was in the 60s. And so then that put me right in the, you know, the actual um, cultural movement of everything that was happening in San Francisco at the time. Right. And in the middle of the, um, eventually the student strike mm-hmm. and the, um, you know, fighting for the ethnic studies departments. And um, so that was, so I'm a San Francisco state veteran. Wow. Yeah. So I was arrested. I went to jail um, because there was the mass mm-hmm. arrest. That's how they broke the strike. Um, it's the longest strike in the history of the student strike there, mm-hmm. longer than any other strike in the country, even though Berkeley sort of came right afterwards, but San Francisco State was first. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I saw a documentary about that recently. You did? Yeah. What they, was that? It was, uh, KQED was throwing something at the San Francisco Public Library. There was a... I think it was like a, a an exchange of ideas day and hmm. everybody goes and you know there's different speakers there's different forms of media that people can interact with and then there was this little room where people can gather and they were showing Asian American movies hmm. and one of them was a documentary interviewing people that organized that mm-hmm. uh, how do you what do you say it's a it's a strike student strike right yes right. yes right. yes right. and I didn't I had no idea until that moment. I was just blown away. And yeah. The yeah. fact that I'm speaking with somebody that actually got, <laughs> was there. you know, arrest, that's, that's so cool. Yeah. Uh, 
Wow. Yeah. I wow, that's amazing. Um, and, and so what you'll like this part too. So one of the things was it was all you know, first it was about the ethnic studies and the black studies, you know, and then and then we went in one day and there was another I was there but I wasn't the one who was making the president. We want a woman's study. And they go, that's it. There's no way there will never be a woman's studies department. Yeah. That you've, now you've crossed the line. I yeah. mean, they actually said that to us. And we're like, wow. oh, and like, oh my God. Wow. You know, so that was, you know, so we've come a long way. I mean, I went to the 50th anniversary um, a couple of years ago now. And, you know, I saw a lot of great, you know, people, Roger Alvarado and, uh, you know, the, just the people that were there holding it all together wow. and, you know, the leaders, you know, we're still, I'm still friends with, with some of them. So some of them are, you know, passing on though, like two have died, I think since Terry Collins died and mm. do you know who he is? No. He, yeah. Terry he was Collins. running KPU for a long time. Okay. And, yeah. Anyway. I'll, I'll look yeah. him up. After yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Sure. Amazing. Amazing. He just died last year. And yeah. so, yeah, after SF State, that's, and then. So then, yeah, so fighting. then at, that was uh, in the 60s. And then I went, then I was recruited to be a part of what was called the Teacher Corps. And the Teacher Corps was a kind of urban peace corps. So, but you would be educated to be teachers in urban settings you would go but the way they had it set up which was really great my style of learning is that you go and they just put you in the classroom Mm -hmm. and then you go to san francisco state and have your classes Mm -hmm. rather than the reverse that you have your classes first and then you go and become a student Uh, teacher yeah (laughs) and so and that's where then my teacher core leader was actually Tom Amiano. So uh-huh. <laughs> you know who he is. No, and, no. Okay, he was a supervisor in San Francisco, and then okay. he was he was in the uh, up in Sacramento for many years. So he's um, he was the, he came out. He was a gay teacher, and you know was proud of it. And so yeah, but a really great character. Wow. Yeah, wow. He's, he's still around too. Yeah. Cool. I think he's retired though now. Yeah. 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 So that was so that was the teacher core. So then I did that, um, and then at the same time, I was starting this Waldorf school. So Whoa. so I was kind of juggling a lot of things simultaneously. Wow. And then, yeah, you're 16. You were teaching more than 16 years, right? Yes, at SF? yeah. Okay, yeah. Just, yeah, I just, I, well, I taught. I also taught in uh, San Francisco Public School, too. Yeah, so yeah. I taught. In, in the public school system, okay. but mostly in alternative schools. I taught at Buena Vista School over on Utah Street in 26. It used to be an alternative school. Got I don't it. know if it is anymore. So your life has been... I taught mostly... at Commodore Stockton in Chinatown for a long time. And wow. Yeah. Mostly, it's all, te- it's all been teaching. You've been a teacher your whole... I've been a teacher a core of my life, but then also this other part, this psychic part, this... Uh, you know, really healer. I'm, I'm also like healer. I, that's, so my private practice is also about healing. Oh, wow. So then (laughs) that's what I mean about this. So then at the time I was starting the Waldorf school, I met this man named Mayor Schneider who was blind and restored his eyesight. And he, and so I started working with him Uh and, and so then I did that practice for a long time where I did energy work and body work. And he worked with what I would call the throwaway cases, like the last, you know, the medical throwaways. They were kind of, they didn't want to have surgery, so they're going to try this. And so the people that I started learning how to do energy work with were kind of like the last causes. And, but after I did that work, I thought, mm-hmm. well, anybody who's less than that is going to be easy yeah, because yeah, yeah. I'm starting with the hardest first. Right. So that was, so that became my, that was my body work practice, which wow. I also did for a long time. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. And then, you... it, and then it morphed eventually into biography work. Cool. Which is, which is what I'm now doing. Yes. Yes. Wow. That's amazing. But yeah, so much of your work has been in, in service of people as a teacher, um, of all people of all ages. Right. Yeah. Um, and 
you know, just to note here, it's I've just read your 16 years at SF Waldorf doing biography work for 25 years. And you mentioned all the stuff that you've right. you've been doing mentoring um, and then going back to Waldorf. Um, yeah. As I mentioned earlier, the stillness in the students, uh, the teachers, a, sh a groundedness, a strong sense of identity um, more than I felt. I feel like I've had in myself mm -hmm. and most adults that I know. Um, there's eye contact, uh, there's a, a sense of calm and tranquility in the, in the children at a very young age and throughout all ages, uh, I've been fortunate enough to witness. Um, what do you think about Waldorf or anthroposophy helps foster this kind of, I, I don't know, I, yeah, that, that stillness, that tranquility. So I think that the primary difference between um, Waldorf education and other educations is that it really um, acknowledges and fosters the um, soul and the spirit of the child. So it's not only addressing the mind or its intellect. Mm -hmm. and, and so the whole curriculum is based on feeding the soul appropriate nourishment as of it, as it moves through various phases of its development. Mm -hmm. So that's I and I so much of what I see in the world right now you know, I mean really good people and and everything, but I see that education is not really meeting people in their whole self. And then this really dovetails in with the biography work because so much of how people feel in the world that is not peaceful has to do with the fact that nobody has sort of given them a map of how their life could be. Hmm. And not in a map of like a dogmatic map, but more people just have these experiences in their life and they just think it's that, that they're chaotic, random experiences rather than thinking, oh, if I start to understand my life experiences, I can start to make sense out of it in a way that isn't just like chaos. Mm -hmm. And so I think if I would say, if I have a message, it would be for people to step back from this idea that life is just like random, that it actually there is a, there there are patterns that are happening there is meaning mm. there is um that there is a world of the invisible that is always speaking to us but we haven't learned how to listen mm. and that we have to learn to pay attention to that world that we can't necessarily see that's not necessarily in the material world mm -hmm. and our culture right now is totally driven by the material everybody's value system how they're treated like you said what they wear what car they have and those are just those are like false gods really mm. the real value of a human being is that everybody is totally individual totally unique totally like a universe unto itself and that we yeah. don't really we can't even encounter another human being because we're we're sort of set up to like not really perceive each other in a certain kind of way or to understand each other. Hmm. So I think that that w the peacefulness that you see in children has to do with the fact that they're being nourished on the level of a soul that then satisfies them and allows them to continue to grow right. their real spirit, their real authentic self, and not that they're not put in a box. Yeah. And as uh, you know, I've just been in aftercare roles, teaching cooking classes mm -hmm. and games and things mm -hmm. like that. And to be in a room full of, you know, let's just say it was, I can remember a time where I was surrounded by fifth graders uh, and to be teaching them something that they've probably been already taught many times <laughs> since kindergarten, but also to speak with them in a way that I don't feel like I'm speaking with a child. I am actually speaking with, I don't know, maybe it is a, sp a spirit or somebody of equal 
right. level <laughs> or higher level. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's right. just I remember I, I asked somebody or, or some, I was serving mac and cheese because I taught the kids how to make mac and cheese. <laughs> and one of them said, asks, uh, you know, can I have can I have more uh, mac and cheese in my bowl? And I said, I don't see why not. And he says, it doesn't hurt to ask. Right. <laughs> and I was like, you know, if I was that kid, I would have been uh, if I was that kid talking to an adult when I was younger, mm. uh, the adult would have probably said, excuse me. Like, <laughs> but he didn't say it in a way that was abrasive. It was just, yeah, it, it really doesn't hurt to ask. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but he didn't, he didn't look at me in a way that was just kind of like, you know, trying to piss me off or anything. Right. It's just really the, his innocence really just led him in that moment. And I was like, yeah, you know, and so it made me think, wow, uh, us as adults, we have so much to guard as far mm. as our pride and our mm. ego mm -hmm. and just being around this environment. It was just mm -hmm. such an eye opener, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I guess that leads me to this next question is as a teacher and you know, you've been a student as well, the, the roles of teachers and students in a school environment, it's, it's very defined where uh, you know, the teacher shows up, students are there to pay attention and learn. But what I've witnessed is that there's so much more going on underneath that right. dynamic. Right. Um, the inner work you mentioned, uh, internal work. And as a student of anthroposophy and a, and a mentor to both teachers and students, what do you think are some underlying transformations in you as a teacher in relation to your students? I think one of the main differences between being a Waldorf teacher and being like a regular state credentialed teacher is that Waldorf teachers are really asked to continue to work on themselves inwardly. That's not a state credential requirement. Right. No. <laughs> it will never well, will yeah. be. And so I think that's the big line in the sand right there. And that's a line that sometimes it's difficult to um, to adhere to. Waldorf teachers are asked to um, meditate on their students on a regular basis. And so what does that mean? That means uh, given this like actual visual seeing each student, seeing them by their, you know, thinking of their name, seeing them and just holding them. Um, and then whatever and then kind of bringing a little light to that student. So that if a student is having difficulty, that's another way to sort of address how to help that student. So we're looking for guidance that's not just coming out of a curriculum book. We're looking for guidance that's actually coming from like a spiritual source and wow. in that sense. And so I think that that's the ideal Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the way I mentor, that's the way I work with faculties that I, and it's not an abstraction, it's a reality. Mm -hmm. So there's, there, so each of us, we all have a soul, we all have a spirit, um, you know, as well as a personality and a physical body and an energy body. So when you're encountering somebody, adult or a child, those are those are all present but then how much do we actually interact with those different parts of ourselves mm. like and, and with another person right right yeah how much do we even acknowledge that right uh, outside of you know yeah like-minded or not like-minded people yeah there's not many people are willing to acknowledge that and i think yeah that's something that i've come across you know me personally um just in in recent years just this kind of like yeah an awakening almost but but yeah I, can you think of any any students throughout your career uh that might have been a bit difficult that were resistant more of a challenge at all uh is, is that still exists oh yeah yes <laughs> i mean oh yes i mean you know <laughs> so yes every every class every there's there are always difficult okay. situations there's not 
I mean, people think, oh, if you send your kid to a Waldorf school, everything's going to be, you know, great. I mean, it's better than most situations. Sure. But it's, no, there's regular difficulties. You know, students are students. They have family situations that are, you know, that are, you know, difficult for them. Um, and, yeah, so there's nothing, there's nothing different about that other than maybe you keep trying to work different ways to when and when I was at the high school one of the things that I would try to do is like if I saw a student was really struggling I would try to accommodate their schedule so that maybe they weren't they didn't have to follow the same schedule as mm. everybody else mm -hmm. until they could get their feet on the ground again and then just give them some space to like land in a new way. And so I had, I had the authority to do that. And that helped a lot of students that it prevented a lot of students from, you know, having to exit the school or, you know, not being able to succeed. Because if you give somebody, I remember once we had this one student and she, um, she had a hearing difficulty and she was transferring in from, I think she was coming into the 10th grade and right away we could see this was going to be difficult for her mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. And so we had a meeting with the parents and we said, um, you know, well, she's, you know, uh, said something about, oh, but she needs to be tested or, you know, something like that. You know, we would ask for an assessment and the parents just like <laughs> threw their hands and go, no. She's been tested. We don't want her tested. We just want her to be in this school and we will, whatever you can do for her is fine. And we don't expect anything. We don't, we don't expect her to graduate. We don't, we just know that this is where she needs to be. And so we said, okay, okay. we'll take, <laughs> okay. If you'll sign off on that, we'll take her. We took her. And as soon as we took her, she <laughs> excelled just like everybody else and totally didn't need any yeah, accommodations yeah. or help. Oh, so that wow. was like, that was just like a miracle, really. Uh -huh. But because the parents were willing to like, no, we're not going to demand that you, that she, you know, has to get a graduation certificate, has to pass all the classes. We don't care if she passes the classes. Wow. We know who she is. And we just know that she needs to be here because of the emotional environment. And... So, wow. that, so that was a really beautiful situation. And it doesn't always go like that. You yeah. Know? So, but in that case, it did. Yeah. So the parents recognized. They the, recognized the who, she, who their daughter was. And then they just said, we know we want her here. Wow. And we're not going to put anything on the school, make demands. Interesting. So I think that, you know, so that was a. But then the fact that she could do everything after everybody let go of their expectations, which is an interesting yeah, you know, yeah. phenomenon. Yeah, so, it's interesting how that works. Once yeah. you let go, finally yes. things start falling into place. Yeah. Wow, I, yeah, yeah. So, um, what yeah. was the other part of that question was, oh, just like why or how they? I, I guess what I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out what the well if there is anything like the the transformation from teacher and student like the symbiotic relationship because it seems like the relationships from mm. first to eighth is the same teacher and you, i and mean some, it's, something that, that's the ideal but it doesn't you know no. sometimes it doesn't always work like that um of course that in a in a waldorf school with a teacher and a class you know there is what we call the karmic relationship, you know, like these are your people that you're meant to be with. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that Steiner did say about that is he said, it doesn't matter. It's not about the material that you're giving to the students. Mm -hmm. It's like, who, who are you? That's who are you as a person who's standing in front of these students? That's, that is the mm -hmm. primary relationship is about, being fully yourself in relationship to these students, not the curriculum. Interesting. And so it's like, that's, so then who are you? You, then it goes back to the teacher of like, okay, I have to work on myself. I have to see what my, 
what 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 is my transformation of my personal life? How am I working on myself? I'm not just doing a rote, um, you know, everyday thing that's the same. I, I have to. It has to be alive. I have to be alive. So I think that's a and that's a really big order for teachers and adults, and yet it keeps it very fresh and it keeps it alive. Wow. Wow. So I think transformation, teachers working on themselves, having some kind of a meditative life of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, having a belief, you know, I would say, or an understanding that there is a world that is beyond the material world. Right. And whatever form that you encounter that. And I think at least in the work that I do when I do, you know, individual biography work, so much of that is where people are struggling mm -hmm. is to understand that world, you know, the world that is not visible. Mm, right, right. And it seems that that's, yeah, that would be very important to work on things within yourself. Because all I remember... I. I wasn't a very good student and all I remember is just being yelled at from mm. by teachers and right. I don't know. I, that's probably part why I was really turned away from, I guess, paying attention to a lot of things. I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's where I, where I usually see it as where it's just, such, it's such a big part of your life to spend with your whole day with yeah. a group of adults that, you know, when you do something wrong, you just get yelled at, <laughs> you right. know, or reprimanded or, you know, taken below, taken to a lower tier to some exceptional student, be underneath some exceptional students. But I don't know. That's not my, yeah, that's not my call, but I'm still unpacking it to this day as an adult, which is yeah. interesting. Well, uh, I mean, if you think about, you know, the idea, you know, of education is supposed to be, to be, you know, connecting people to you know wider worlds and mm. so yelling at somebody is like a contraction it's like that's that's <laughs> not how you're going to like expand some you want to expand a child's consciousness not to shrink it and you know i think yelling is just probably a frustration because basically sure. at that point that adult doesn't really know what to do and that's just how they respond you know they Got respond it. by yelling because they're they don't know what to do yeah so it's their kind of their limit is is what's happening unfortunately it's you know transferred to the student and then the the thing the way that you get out of that or you reverse it is that you have to make sure that you're not like yelling at yourself you know, internally, that you don't haven't internalized it. Right. That's like the key to that. Interesting. A key, a key to any abuse or misalignment in, you know, growing up has to do with then redoing that experience hmm. internally. Hmm. Yeah. And, you know, that, that makes me think of like a lot of the things that I was, that we were taught at a very early age, especially um, when I think about, being in a Catholic school, um, it caused me to question, yeah, a lot of what I was taught. And in, later in life, I've, I've dismissed a lot of ideas. Mm. Um, I wouldn't say, well, some of them as untrue, but mostly the stuff in relation to the rituals at church, but, mm. you know, it's subjective on my part, but, um, I guess going back to anthroposophy, it seems to merge both science and spirituality. Uh, whereas Catholicism was just more kind of like everything was based on faith. Mm. Um, right. But with Waldorf teaching, it's uh, spirituality and science are often <laughs> contradictory to a lot of people, right? Right. Um, and that may may create some cognitive dissonance, uh, which is. Yeah, I guess how I felt when I was younger in, in Catholic school. So I guess what I'm trying to ask is, do you feel that anthroposophy develops a different personal compass for finding and discerning truth? And how, how did you communicate that as a teacher? Well, first of all, um, 
a Waldorf teacher never teaches anthroposophy Got in it. Waldorf education. That's, I see. that's just, that's not done. Okay. So um, anthroposophy is the philosophy that Rudolf Steiner developed. There are aspects or threads of that that are in the curriculum, but it's not, it's, that's never happening anywhere in, 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 in education. Maybe in the last year when, when the seniors, they'll come to us and they'll say, we want to understand what is this Waldorf education all about, you know, and they sort of ask to understand it. So then from that, from their perspective of asking, then, then teachers will maybe kind of shine a little light on the connection for them. But it's never, there's never a, um, it just, that's just not, doesn't happen. Okay. 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 So what I would say, you know, the way that anthroposophy grounds people who, who want to take it up as a study or to help themselves is that it's, it's a world view. It's huge. It's like Steiner has given like probably the biggest worldview of, you know, any <laughs> philosopher and and it's 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 pretty la- large. It's pretty all-encompassing. It's not perfect. I mean, it's not perfect. Steiner was a human being. There were lots of their contradictions. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's not um, you know, he, he's not perfect. He wasn't a perfect human being. Mm-hmm. He said some things earlier on, he retracted them later, you know, so there's a lot of contradictions in anthroposophy. But I would say that the he was so far ahead of himself in the future. You know, he was also the founder of biodynamic gardening, besides mm-hmm. Waldorf education. And um, many, many forms that are still to come. I mean, he was talking about the internet like, you know, a hundred years ago, Mm -hmm. but calling it, like he said, there will be a web that will surround the earth at a certain point that will make it more difficult for people to be able to have spiritual connection. And I think, well, here we are, we're here. Mm -hmm. You know, you, we were out camping in the desert in the spring and we looked up and we were looking for shooting stars. And all of a sudden we saw this like, like these satellites and it was like there were like 50 or 100 of them and it was like the starlink I, oh, right. we were like yeah. what is this and we had never seen that and there it is just you know like a hundred satellites just like in a chain mm. and you know and that's how everybody's like hooked up yeah so there's there's the web right there <sighs> um wow you know so the i would say the foundation of anthroposophy is study you know understanding like that we have these different bodies as mm-hmm. a human being you know the physical body the energy body the astral body which is the emotional body and then our higher self mm. and that when we so in biography work <clears throat> to get people to start connecting to their higher self is what allows them to like get their own guidance so anthroposophy is about people being free, not mm. following a belief system, right. but really freeing themselves to be their own, in a way, their own spiritual teachers, their own oh, spiritual wow. guides. So wow. it's a very different kind of uh, spiritual path than many, and it's difficult because mm-hmm. of that, because mm-hmm. everybody wants a teacher, everybody wants to be told what to do, and in mm-hmm. a way, we have to kind of grow up Mm -hmm. and take on our own, you know, development, which Mm. we are reluctant to do. Your work in China, Mm. Chengdu. Chengdu, was it? Chengdu, yeah. Chengdu, yeah. Uh Uh, You know, with trying to implement uh waldorf high school does that is is doing in doing that was there already an an elementary school in place in chengdu okay yeah yeah okay yeah they had they had an elementary school and then they were wanting to develop a high school and so for their elementary school students i see and so so we were several of us i think about five of us were invited to 
come and do a teacher begin a teacher training for these um, for this you know for these teachers to become Waldorf high school teachers and what was interesting about that was that they were the people who were wanting to become Waldorf teachers were children of the people who had been in the Cultural Revolution and so they knew what they did didn't want because their parents had suffered a lot through that Mm. cultural revolution and they'd lost a lot and at that point I think one of the reasons why Waldorf education became so big in China is because their educational system was just very academic it was very um, harsh it was very uh, rote and it was not creative Mm -hmm. and so these people really wanted a creative education for their children and so those were the they were the asking for it you know the 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 parents Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. these children and they were the ones who were taking the teacher training was this met with any kind of resistance at all or well we were you know there are rules when you go to china to um that you're not supposed to you can't talk about politics you technically are not supposed to talk about uh, spirituality, you know, because it's it is a communist country, yes. and so and they said, and there will be people there who are going to be observing you that are from the state. So wow. you know, so so there was, you know, so so we were, you know, we were told that, <clears throat> which I thought was okay. I said, how are we going to teach anthroposophy? All it is is spirituality, but I guess we just couldn't use the S word, you know. <laughs> yeah. And so, <clears throat> and my, and of course, I was told that I would not be able to teach biography because um, the, you know, the Chinese people are don't share on that level of their personal, you know, mm-hmm. the, their, their personal lives and that they would not do it. And I just said, oh, please, just let me try. Yeah. <laughs> I said, let me try. I know, I hear what you're saying, I understand, but let me try. And so I did it and they loved it. And uh, they loved it so much that they, they stayed up all night. Once I, we did it and they just, like, they couldn't stop talking about it because I gave them a format and a structure in which they could actually share their feelings and that just opened up the floodgates. Wow. And so it was very, very powerful and they, they really, really appreciated wow. it and loved it. Yeah. How big is this school? Um, well, I had at the, in the, we had at least 40 or close to 45 or 50 people in the class I was teaching. I don't know how, I don't now, I don't know actually how big the high school is, but they've graduated. They graduated a high school class. Wow. So, yeah. That is huge. Yeah. Uh, and there are many, there are many like um, Waldorf schools all over China, of course, now since the pandemic. I know that there are some people that are teaching. I know some of my colleagues are teaching online to China. The thing about when you teach in China, you have to teach through translation because I don't speak Mandarin, I don't speak Chinese, and they don't speak English. So so that was a different way of teaching, but yeah. Okay, and there's always somebody from the state watching That was, we were told just to be aware that that would, you know. Wow. And the other thing about the state is that, you know, at any time they can just come in and like say, we're closing. This is over. It's it's over. Yeah. So that was, you know, that hasn't happened in, Mm -hmm. you know, because I think the person who's running the school is just very skilled and kind of a genius about knowing how to like navigate, you know, with the politics wow. of China. I mean, they did come in at one point and say they were going to run up. They, they, clo- they had to close a kindergarten because they were going to run like a rail system or something. You know, they, there was <laughs> nothing they could do about that. Like, OK, yeah. you know, if they want to do that, they, yeah. they can do that. Um, so, yeah, but I, you know, we don't really know what's happened since wow. the pandemic, you know, and it's been, it's been a very extreme over there. It's very, very extreme. Wow. That's... So, and I don't think anybody, any, nobody is allowed to go you know, from the state. Mm-hmm. They're not letting anybody in, mm-hmm. but I think they're still going, you know, this, you know, so. Wow. Yeah. I would have never expected to hear about a Walder. I know they're all over the world, but I would have never expected to hear about uh, Waldorf schools in China. That's yeah. 
<clears throat> they, they're all, I mean, there's, they're all over the world. I mean, there's, I mean, there was a, there was a Waldorf school that was the first integrated, um, Israel and Palestinian student school in mm-hmm. Israel, mm. or, or wow. maybe or maybe it's Palestine. I can't remember. It's probably Israel, where the Waldorf students worked. At, you know, I mean, where the teachers, the Palestinians and the you know Israelis worked together to create a s- school. I had another friend who created the first Waldorf integrated Waldorf school in South Africa. Wow! So. Uh-huh. So it's, it, and there's another aspect of Waldorf education that um, where they're going into um, places where there's war and they're doing aspects of Waldorf education, like the art experience, the music, to help to heal the mm-hmm. children. And it has, a, it has a different name. Like there's a whole component of anthroposophists now that are like taking that track and like going into these areas of where there's a lot of trauma where it's needed where it's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and taking like the healing aspects of Waldorf education I would say the other one when you're saying what is that piece is from art mm. the big creative artistic uh, thread that is like key to Waldorf education that is just as important as reading and writing and math art is not considered like a side activity it's really like an essential activity and i would say that also applies to the adult world as well i love that 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 people that if you can take up some kind of an art form for yourself you don't have to go and study anything it's just that that connects that soul experience Mm. and i think that's like what Waldorf students really have and they thrive on that. Mm -hmm. So, um, technology and logic, uh, science seems to be the core of everything these days. Yeah. Very opposite to what you, you said. I mean, not many business leaders say, you know, take up a art, art and it's always like learn how to code learn how to, you know logic study logic and critical thinking of course those are very valuable but in in this type of education uh how where, where it is technology knowing where this world is going i mean it's it's yeah it's crazy it's, right it's, <clears throat> definitely um you know, I think originally when we were in the first kindergarten, uh, that I remember having an interview with the teacher, and she said something about, um, "Did we have a television?" And I said, "And I said, of course we have a television. I said, this is America. Everybody has a television." <laughs> right, 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 right. And she just sort of looked at me, you know, and then she says, "Well, you know, we ask that our children don't watch television." And I go. Okay, you know, sort of like, Good luck. So, so, yeah. you know, so there was that whole introduction of, you know, like, uh, no TV. Um, and then one day she, I went to the school to pick up my son and she sort of brought me out into the yard and she said, I want you just to observe the children playing in the yard. And she said, and she said, I wonder, I want you to see if you can tell which ones watch television and which don't by just watching them play. <laughs> and, so, you know, so the phenomenon of like not telling me it's bad or you shouldn't do it, just use your own eyes, see for your, observe yourself and see what you see. Mm-hmm. And so I could clearly see it. I mean, it was like really right. obvious. And so I, you know, so, but of course that was a long time ago now and the technology has gotten more extreme. <laughs> And there is more, I would say, danger for children. And the, you know, the whole screen issue was not an issue when my son was in school mm-hmm. the way it is an issue now for my grandson, you know, which is a different, you know, generation. Yeah. Much more um, damaging, I think, in the long run. And so I think it's a, it's it's not a good situation, you know. I mean, in terms of children ex- being exposed to screen in the constant way that they are, and even for the adults, in ter- there is there is science and there is logic in Waldorf schools. There is yes. strong academics. Um, but what what is th- what is your 
uh, my, I question. was asking if if there is a kind of okay. This is the landscape of the world moving forward. Technology is going to be a part of. Mm. Is that a belief, or is it more kind of like uh, more of a resistance, um, or is the education centered around maybe finding a way around that kind of dependence on? technology because the more i read about technology it's just it just feels like it's just a behemoth that just not gonna yeah. stop yeah. and it's it's working its way into every aspect of our lives and i know i'm you know i'm i'm 40 years old i'm not as attuned to somebody who's let's say you know 15 uh, or 21 or 25. Um, so there's just like a growing gap. Right. It used to just be, you know, art, media, music. That was a age gap. Now it's technology. Now it's everything's fused together. So I, yeah, that's, that's just where I was trying to go is how you see it as somebody that's been a teacher and a student of this. I kind mean, of I, I'm a in a time. really different category because I didn't even experience television until I was like 10 years old. So because it hadn't been invented and we didn't really have one. And so I had 10 years with no none of that in my life. And so here's a here's an interesting phenomenon that people, you know, some people in in Waldorf circles educators say whether or not it's true is that that you can kind of see the strength of when there's been no exposure and then the weakness of when there's been overexposure. Like the actual human being <laughs> has less forces of being able to like handle situations. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that's just... So the other big phenomenon about anthroposophy is like uh, it's... It's like you observe the phenomenon. You observe what's in front of you and you make your deductions from that rather than what somebody tells you, how the deduction should be. You make your own observations. You observe right. like what's happening, mm -hmm. what's happening here. And it's the same way going back to biography. It's like you observe your biography. What is, what is happening in my life? You know, and you use that observation as starting to become information for you to figure out what's, what transformation is taking place. Right. And I'm glad you brought that up because at this point in my life, you know, I've, I've, I have a practice, an inward practice, mm -hmm. meditation, journaling. Um, You're 40? 41. 41? 41. Okay. All right. I so, can tell you where you're headed. <laughs> great. Yeah. 40, 42, right? right the seven right, year, right, right. You know, seven year cycle. Right. And this, this is crazy because I have instances in my life where I just feel like, uh, yeah, a very much, uh, an awakening or, of like, I'm looking at myself from the outs, observing myself outside of my body. Mm -hmm. And it's not, like, oh, uh, well, this is the best way I could describe it is I'm just like, even though I do different things, things differently, I'm just like everybody else only, you know, in my own way. And, uh, I guess the best way I could summarize it is, uh, are you familiar with Ram Dass? Uh-huh. He okay. was in my graduation speaker at Whoa. California uh, Institute of Integral Studies. Oh, shit. <laughs> and that was after he had a stroke. He could huh. hardly talk. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. This is crazy because I've been listening to a lot of him lately, and mm. um, it's really helped me mm. find this, yeah, the inner stillness, the groundedness. Mm. But when he says we, you, 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 you know you're – kind of slowly waking up when you realize you are not who you thought mm. you were. Mm -hmm. um, and going to but your biography work, uh, does that have a place in biography counseling where you're kind of just 
feeling like you're shedding away things. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Absolutely. So that's the goal. Is that the goal of biography work, you would say? Or? So biography work, I brought this just so it could be a good visual. So this is my biography chart, and it's basically the story of the incarnation of a person's life. Wow. So you're you're born and then you start to incarnate. So first you're just really just a spiritual being and you barely barely have like a body, you know. And then and then as you each 7 year cycle um, you develop more, you know, capacities more and each 7 year cycle like something what I call a spiritual gift is born. In, in each seven year cycle. So the cycle that you're in, you're, tell me how, you're 41? 41, Okay. Yeah. Oh so, no. <laughs> yeah. so, so here, the, it, down here is like, I said, need to cross the bridge to an inner life. That's, that's kind of like what this time period is like. And so that also acts as a kind of, it would say the classic midlife crisis because sometimes instead of going to an inner life, people think, oh, I need a new wife or I need a new car or I need a new job. That, wow. and, and, but it's actually a <laughs> spiritual crisis of like, actually, I need to have an inner life. And so that's what's, that's what's being asked for at that time. Wow. Then when you get to 42, this is 42 to 49 is the really what I call Whoa. the kick-ass cycle. Kick-ass cycle, <laughs> yeah. This was my most difficult cycle, many people's cycle. doesn't have to be difficult for you because this is the cycle. It's the Mars cycle, and it's the cycle of um, really honing and getting the essence of your authentic self, becoming really who you are mm. so it does mean like a shedding and throwing off of thing education parental thoughts implants things that have been implanted to you by the outside world about your identity right and really getting to like who am i who who you know who really am i in in this life right and what did i come to do and that's like and so there's a lot of a lot of action that happens in this this cycle it could be happening already now yeah you know and it sounds like just you know from what you're doing with these podcasts that you're already doing something like that you know mm. that it's already mm -hmm. manifesting so wow. the question i would ask you that you know if you don't mind sure no of course like okay then i would ask what question are you living with in terms of your own inner like wow thought process this is crazy because <laughs> Do you remember, we, you and I have spent a little bit of time together, but the last time you and I saw each other physically was uh, towards the end of 2021. You sat in on a group at the school, and I think you were leading a, a workshop about what extremes we've experienced because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was during a time where I was really feeling like, oh, wow, I, I, I just really feel like the need to share this with you because mm -hmm. um, I was really feeling the, the, the weight of not being able to conceive and start a family and have children because the whole time when I ever since I was a kid, I thought that was my I guess, Dharma, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That that's what I was going to do. That's what I prepared myself to be a, mm. a good father. Um, and so that time was like me at my worst. And I had no intention at that day of sharing it with, to me, was a group of strangers. But it was a safe space that I really felt. And thank you for providing that, that space to share that. And leading up to probably a couple of months ago, I was already like, I, this is, I'm good. Like I've accepted mm. this grief that I've been living with mm. and I no longer have any anger towards anybody or blame or anything. And I said to myself, I said, I, I, I can go on a retreat. I can go to maybe Bhutan or just like find a llama and and really immerse myself in in this this world that I felt I feel has really given me uh, a sense of peace uh, that I've been looking for for a really long time and maybe a month ago 
I had COVID. Uh, <laughs> I've just been kind of just, I was, I was bed, kind of bedridden, but not really that sick. But that's besides the point. Um, my wife and I had it at the same time. Mm. One morning she leaves because she got over it uh, earlier than I did. And she comes back and I'm sitting on the couch and I'm coming out of a meditation practice, which I do every morning. And she passes by. I could hear her. And when I come out of it, she throws something at me. Two things. I pick it up off the ground and it's pregnancy tests that say positive. (laughs) Yeah. So I was like. It says pregnant on it. And I look at her and I'm like, no, this is not real. This is a glitch. Because we had gone through IVF that time uh, and that failed. And we'd been married for almost 10, uh, well, now going on 12 years in September. Nothing happened. And now, you know, after I've come to this acceptance of hey, I, I think I, this is the spiritual path is for me. Then this curveball totally comes into our lives and it's like, wow, uh, no, this is not right. Is she but pregnant? also, yes, she is. Oh, yeah. Oh my God. Oh, my <laughs> yeah. God. oh that's so beautiful. I had no oh, intentions of, sh- she's, John, she's, that uh, is gorgeous. She's about That's a miracle. nine weeks. It is a miracle. That's a miracle. Wow. So just yesterday we saw the, I had no intention of sharing this today, but I just felt the need to, since you brought that up, I'm like, oh, uh, well, yeah, it's, you know, I've always thought about you because you were always a, you know, yeah, it is. It, it, those things were taboo to talk about during wow. that time and to provide that space. It was just, so I was going to ask yeah. you, like, what, what, were, what did you share in that? time when you said you weren't going to share what to just give oh me the, yeah just, or just give me that <laughs> like just give me like i said the my limit was just uh was it the small group when you were in like two, yeah. two or three people mm-hmm. okay you knew you sat in with us uh-huh. and i shared that uh you know i think i found out that uh, my brother-in-law and his his girlfriend were pregnant and that was my limit where i was just like wow uh, you know I have to show, which I did. I felt the need to show support, but also that felt like the closing of a door where, hey, you know, I'm 40 now. And it's probably not where my wife is also 40. We're seven days apart mm-hmm. uh, as far as birthdays go. And that was it. That was the that was the limit. I was like, wow, I have to show support. I have to show that I'm happy. I mm. have to show. And there was no place to be like, mm. oh, damn like you know and i remember it was just very i didn't want to be it was he, they announced it on um christmas day mm. christmas morning and yeah, i was like wow i don't want to be around right now yeah even though i am happy but also it's very loaded yeah. there's no space to yeah but anyway that all happened my wife and i experienced uh you know healing together maybe she was a little bit you know further along than I was as far as healing was but um yeah wow yeah, and that's that's what happened and then you show me that chart and I was like whoa <laughs> what is the question now yeah you so know? what is the what is your question what is the question is yeah uh, go inside and just wow. sort of see. I have to think about that yeah what's what's because right now after everything that we've been through I'm I'm thinking no matter what happens, the universe is going to do its thing. Mm. I don't have any control. Mm. It, this is an, a miracle in itself. Mm-hmm. And uh, good or bad, it's going to, I mean, success or not, whether this pregnancy mm. is seen through all mm. the way to the end, it's going to change my life no matter what. And I recognize that. Okay. Uh, so maybe the, I don't maybe, have a question right now, yeah, honestly. May, I, I, maybe I feel the question is just like um, living in the wonder, living in the not knowing. and You're very much right about that. Accepting the unknown, because that's what's really hard for Western mind to do, mm-hmm. is to accept the unknown. And, and to live in the mystery 
of never understanding why certain things happen in the world. And, um, you know, like my husband and I say, you know, we're not going to know this until after we cross the threshold and we go to that place where all things are revealed to us, sure. you know, yeah. like the, the Karma Loka. I'm, like, I'm going to ask that question when I get to Karma Loka because that's the only place you're going to know the answer to that. So I think it's, and, and maybe you had to go through this process for some thing, some kind of development of some, so like, you know, this idea yeah. that what is developed in each cycle, I would say that sometimes cycles that are difficult can be, well, we're developing the capacity to endure. Like endurance is actually a spiritual capacity. Mm. And so, and you know, and that often comes through the path of pain and suffering. That's how, that is is the path of endurance. And, you know, and I think the thing about pain and suffering that is, you know, has become, um, you know, it's not understood as a spiritual spiritual development. Mm -hmm. It's seen as like something, there's something wrong with you rather than when we have pain and suffering, we're actually developing ourselves in a certain kind of spiritual way. Mm. It's not masochistic. It's just how life works. If we were just like sitting around on clouds eating bonbons and nothing was happening, we wouldn't be <laughs> developing. We do yeah. not, humans do not develop out of like an easy life, you know? And so that's what I tell people about biography. It's like biographies are, I, I mean, I've seen hundreds, probably thousands of people. I don't know, thousands, wow. but you know, and there's not a person on the planet that is not suffering. I mean, there's just no, they might act like they're not suffering and they might give you a face like they're not there to present but the reality is if they sit in front of me they usually <laughs> tell me I mean you know even in grocery stores people will start telling me things like I'm just buying my bread you know yeah, yeah. They, they just, whoa yeah yeah I yeah. mean I'm used to it it's like my husband's like okay there she goes again you know and uh, they usually tell me their deepest darkest secret that they've never told anybody else yeah. you know and so it just because there's a reception I'm not looking for it, but they re they know that they can, they feel they can do that. I see that. And yeah. so that happens. Mm. So there's, but there's, you know, there's so much in the Western world about like presenting and pretending and like, you know, like pseudo, like, oh, everything's fine. Yeah. Everything is not fine. Right. Everything is really not fine, mm. especially right now. Mm -hmm. You know, that's mm -hmm. why that idea of like the hut that you each person needs to build a hut. We need to build protection around ourselves. Mm. Uh, we can't let other people's influences come in and like take away from our, you know, our spiritual development in a certain way. Right. The hut. I like that concept. So that means if you go out in the world and you interact with a bunch of people, when you come back, then you have to check in and see, did I pick things up? You know, what's mine? What's not mine? And you need to clean it. It's like cleanse it and like let it release it and let it go. Mm. When you when you talk about a hut, is it like a roofless hut? Are you allowed to feel the weather? That kind of thing. I think, you know? I think it's more this idea of a hut of like, a, it's a spiritual hut. So it's like, how do you contain your own spiritual development as mm. you're developing it? How, are, how do you hold your nourishment? How do you hold your spiritual experiences right. so that they are, they're taken care of? So it's, it's that kind of a hut. It's like, I see that you don't let people's negativity or their ideas about what they you they think you're doing you don't let them sort of tear you apart or tear or take things away from you. I should see that. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's so easy for that to happen. I mean, it happens right. a lot. Right. Yeah, and I like what you said about suffering because a lot of stuff I felt I feel like did really need to happen. And most of it was just shedding of a lot of the baggage that I was carrying around. Ego, mm. um, pride, uh, yeah. Just the feeling the need to say, uh, save face mm. and to be uh, just a part of, you know, 
setting boundaries for 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 myself is right. what I feel, and and I'm Filipino, and it's always you know be around family, be around as many people as you can, and right. eat as much as you can, right? Or, yeah. uh, for celebrations, and yeah. you know, no, uh, yeah. sometimes I just want to be in the corner talking to somebody, yes. really seeing somebody for who they are, and them seeing me for who I am. And that's hard for me to be around people that aren't receptive to that kind of space. Right. So there, yeah. I mean, because the Hawaiians, Hawaiians, <laughs> yeah, similar. Yeah. Similar, and I've had plenty of Filipino cousins, and you know, we're intermarried with Filipino yes. people, so I know that. I know that. Cool. Uh, but I so when the way that I look at that is like for the, these cultures that are very, I would say tribal you know for uh, you know in a positive sense like communal mm. that when you start to individuate that be- creates a conflict because yes that, because <laughs> the because the tribe in a way resists people individuating because that means that you might leave the tribe and so there is tension and I've always been the person in my tribe who's just, who's also individuated and yes. doesn't, you know, go along with all the rules of the, you know. And uh, so I know that very, very well. But the path right now is individuation. That is the path of humanity. We are individuating mm-hmm. out of our group souls or our group situations to become individuals who then will collectively as individuals kind of reconvene, um, you know, in a group, Mm -hmm. but in a different way, not just kind of out of habit or out of cultural, like this is just what we know. It's, it's a, it's an evolution of the culture in a certain way. Wow. And if you think of anybody, you know, in the Filipino culture, in the Hawaiian, I mean, people that have been like the leaders of the culture are definitely st- have stepped out of the culture, you yeah. know, and have the radicals and you know, whatever they've done, you know, they've, they haven't been, they haven't just been following, you know, the, the convention. Sure. Yeah. So I think it's about like leaving convention and being your individual self and letting that be okay. So that's more of your 42 to 49. You're going to do a lot more of that Mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. there. Mm. So that's look, look forward to that. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I am looking forward. I feel like, you know, it's, it's definitely turning into something, uh, that's, that's changing, shifting for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I, is that, biography work are we if, are we all weighed down by these stories that you know going back to we're not who we think we are are we weighed are we really weighed down by uh the 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 narrative that we have about ourselves and is it all is the based on you know your work as a biography counselor is it do you see more healing when people are shedding things away and unpacking things in that way um, I, I think that the beauty of, of biography work is for people to realize that the experiences that they've had, even if they've been difficult, have, have there's something to get out of that. There's something to um, understand. Maybe it's if it's abuse, a different difficult life situation, you know, as a child. That's not to say that that's right. That's I, I would never say that. But when somebody has had an experience like that, you can't take that away from them. That's been their biography. So then, how do they have tools to like look at that more objectively in a way of like, okay, this was. My, I mean, many times I see people that have had abuse of, you know, experiences as young children. They can be very, very strong spirits. And they, they, in spite of that, they, you know, they rise above it. I mean, they become very powerful people. Mm. And that's not to say that they had to be abused in order to be that. But it's like, it's, we have to learn how to, yes, I think not just taking like a psychological approach to it, but more, I would say, a spiritual lens to try and look at. Like I could say, 
why did my father have to die when I was 60? I mean, I could spend my life, I spent a fair amount, many years being upset about that, yeah. you know, and yet I knew in me that was some, that my whole life changed. Our whole, my mother's life, my sister and brother, well, our whole life completely upended. Mm-hmm. And so that was there was there was a reality to that that just was not ever going to go away and so so i had i have so i had a choice work with it or just be forever upset about it you know right. and i say it's like it's like both and like we have pain and suffering but if we have pain and suffering it doesn't mean that we can't have joy that we can have both and like tetnot han said i heard him speak once and he said The war in Vietnam was horrible. And he said, I'd wake up and there would be bombs dropping and it was awful, he said. But then I would look and the sun would be rising, he said, and the sun was beautiful. And he said, and I had to expand my heart so that I could include the dropping bombs and the sunrise. Wow. And so that is a little bit of what we're all asked to do in our lives. We have pain and suffering and we can also still have another part of ourselves but i think we we're in a binary we always think it's either or right that we and rather than it's like no we have to expand ourselves big enough to contain wow. both hmm. so i think in that way um you know so biography i think is helping people look at patterns yes and talking about their their experiences that maybe they have to like recover or heal from in the past and then, like, let it, let him go. Mm. And um, it's interesting that you said you wanted to go to Bhutan. That was the last international trip that I took. Whoa. That we just, and it was a totally intuitive, like, I just okay. told my husband, we are going to Bhutan. And he was like, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he's like, wait a minute. No, you know, why? And yeah. I go, I don't know, but we're going. Wow. And, and, and we found a trip that was in January in the winter. So it was half the cost of all the other Bhutan trips because mm. it was like not, it was in the, in the spring. And we went and we, <laughs> when we, and it was the most um, fantastic trip of my life and if that may if that's my last international trip well then that was that's that'll be it that's Whoa. fine but when we got back they were the airports were like, my son was texting me from we were in the Delhi airport waiting and he's texting me going you need to get COVID masks and that COVID you know and we're like and I'm read it to the group I was with six people and they everybody laughed they go COVID what's you know what's that you know they like oh yes SARS yeah. you know yeah. they just like it was a joke mm-hmm. and we came back they were shutting the airlines down there were news news people at the airport you know recording that all the airlines were stopping all their planes to china and all this yeah you know as we got off our airplane we just got back in the country at you know like right under the wire whoa so okay, we, we were okay. one of the last groups tour groups to to be to get out of bhutan oh, wow so anyway yeah wow the last place <laughs> that was the last place you went to in 2020 in 2020 in 2020 yeah whoa. january 2020 yeah wow. and then well of course february and then you know march mm. yeah so and i'm sure pe- many people had COVID on the airplane oh, but yeah, you know yeah. but just you know everybody was yeah coughing and <laughs> yeah i i i experienced it on a, a cruise ship i think before it was even huh. officially here uh-huh, uh, t- uh-huh. yeah and it was just yeah, yeah one of the whole most horrible experiences of my <laughs> my life having that and i don't even know if it was officially covid but so you got it twice I might have gotten it twice. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, it, the first one wasn't even official because yeah, you know, there was a lockdown, and I. Yeah. But I was on the cruise ship. Just it was a seven day trip. On day three, I just locked myself up. I wasn't even. You were sick. You were really. I sick. I was really sick. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Really. But yeah, since we're almost yeah. uh, you know yeah. at at time, uh, I yeah. guess I'll we yeah. just have time for one more. Um, wow. Thank you so much for doing this. This I, I don't we know went if off, you're getting what you want. No, no, we went off script so many times. This is okay. Uh, I, all I, all I'm really looking for is just a really, you know, genuine, spirited conversation. Okay. So thank you so much. Uh, well, yeah, one last one. Okay. Um, 
I guess you mentioned chaos in one of the last conversations you had on that mm. podcast that I'll mention. Um, mm-hmm. And it is, yeah. This you mentioned it too earlier. This is a very chaotic time, um, but uh, acknowledging chaos and the, and the acceptance of it. Uh, yeah, what do you feel that that can teach us, and how how does somebody plan around chaos? I guess what's mm-hmm. the best mo? Okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I guess, you know, my observations about what's been happening, you know, for the last two and a half years is that there is this deconstruction of old forms that is happening. And, you know, it's happening in the way that things have been done and the way that mandates have gone down in the way that the government and the health authorities are treating, you know, the human beings right now. Um, so there's this sort of interesting polarity of like more authority, perceived authority kind of taking over, taking control of our lives. And at the same time, there's a kind of deconstruction of like law and order, (laughs) you know, like people being unhoused, uh, you know, a lot of chaos and, um, systems, you can't get things because, you know, there's a supply situation now, which I don't even believe is true. I think people are just using these these things now. Like, oh, it's COVID. We can't open the, you can't go to the park because it's COVID. And you can't go here because there's COVID. And you can't go to that museum because it's COVID. You know, so I think that we're like, so I'm just, so what am I recommend is like, first you observe you observe what is happening, you know, and we don't deny it. We, we have to really look it in the eye and say, okay, this is really happening. And, you know, the climate, the climate situation, the weather, the drought, the fires, you know, like these things are really happening. And what, what does it mean? You know, so we, we, we have first, we observe, we say, okay, this is happening. We're not going to pretend like it's not happening. It is happening. And that is like, Even the fires, I mean, they're releasing, you know, it releases all this energy. And now that energy is like free floating Mm. and sort of, and when I say about chaos, that's the chaos that I feel energetically is just out there. So then when I say, when I go, when I make a choice, I'm going to go out somewhere, like I have a sketching group that I go out with, you know, once a week. And I was thinking on my way back from it today, I was thinking, um, what I like about my sketching group is we go into these public places, but we're this group and we're just together and we're Mm. creating our own kind of little bubble of energy that allows us to do this art in a public place. Mm. And it's, it's actually tangible because if I was just there by myself, it would be a lot harder for me to sketch in a cafe where there's, 50 other people or 30, you know, but if I'm with a group of three or four people and we're all sitting at a table sketching, it like creates, that's my hut. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I I just had that kind of awareness today, like why it feels so good to go out with my little group. I mean, I do sketch on my own too, but that's outside makes a big difference. So that's a way of how do you manage the energy? First, you have to be aware of it. Like if you go into a public place, are you aware of the energy that is emitting Mm. and so and and if you are you might not always want to stay there Mm. depending on what the energy is like right and then or if you come back from a place and you feel disoriented then you have to do what i call that hygienic check-in to see like energetically what have i picked up or what do i need to like like send away send out for myself you know get yourself back in to your own energy field so I think that's that's one way to deal with the chaos. We we can't control the chaos. We're not. This mm. is we're, we're you know Steiner said that the children that are born at this time, the adults that are living on the planet at this time, this is this they have the strength to deal with what they came here at this time. So if they're being born in a difficult time, it means that they have the strength to handle it. Mm. So I think that's does that 
ham, was, sir. No, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I'm just very grateful for this time uh, that you set aside to speak with me. Um, learned so much that I never expected uh, about San Francisco and your history. Uh, yeah, you. Uh, I'm. I'm just. I just feel very grateful for this, and thank you so much, Karen, for for this You're opportunity. Welcome. Thank right. you, John. All right. Thank gonna, you. Any any last thoughts you want to say? or? Uh, I think a last thought is to um, encourage people to really connect to their, to their soul and to their spirit and to their higher self and to know that they can have guidance when they want it. <sighs> Thank you so much, Karen. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thanks, everybody, for listening. How are we doing? Tell us how we're doing. Suggest someone to appear on the show um, by trying to spread the good word uh, that we are trying to just connect and talk to people with unique and beautiful perspectives. So if you enjoy this this conversation, please reach out to us. Check us out on the QuakeCityPortal.com. Uh, subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. We're post constantly posting uh, short, shorter versions of these conversations. Um, in video format and also on the quakecityportal.com you'll find show notes the links to our social media accounts and where you are more than encouraged to reach out to us and let us know what you think um, and, and there on the website uh, the quakecityportal.com um, you'll see much much more and uh, until next time hope you enjoyed this conversation um, all right. See y'all down the road. Bye-bye.